This is part two of my How to Play Surf Sup tutorial. In part one, I went over the music of Surf Sup and how to play it on piano. So if you are interested in learning how to play Surf Sup on piano, please check out part one of this tutorial. I will leave a link to that video in the description and a title card should pop up right about now that you can click on to bring you to that video as well. But in part two, I wanted to discuss the lyrics for a bit because in my experience, this is one of, if not the most, misquoted Beach Boys songs of all time. And many people are uncertain about the lyrics in terms of their meaning as well. And so I wanted to discuss both of those aspects. Regarding the misquoting of Surf's Up, to emphasize this point, I want to point something out. In 1971, the first lyrics to Surf's Up were officially published in a insert lyric sheet included in all vinyl copies of Surf's Up. The first few sentences read, a diamond necklace played the pawn, hand in hand, some drummed along, to a handsome man and baton. These were the primary lyrics that most people knew about for many decades after the 1971 version came out. In 2004, Brian Wilson revisited Smile and made a re-recording of Surf's Up after reviving Smile as a whole as a live performance. When the lyrics to the Surf's Up version that he re-recorded were published in the Brian Wilson Presents Smile CD booklets, which you can see one of right here, the lyrics to this one are different. These go, a diamond necklace played the pawn, hand in hand, some drummed along, to a handsome mannered baton. Interesting. In 2011, the original Smile Sessions were released. In the five CD version of the Smile Sessions box set, this book was included. If we flip to Surf's Up, this one says, the diamond necklace played the pawn, so that's different. Hand in hand, some drummed along, to a handsome mannered baton. What about the sheet music? Those of you who have seen part one of this video and maybe some of my other tutorials and piano covers know that I keep the sheet music to Brian Wilson Presents Smile and the Surf's Up album on my music rack on my keyboard. This one says, a diamond necklace played the pawn, so we're back to a uh, instead of the. Hand in hand, some drummed along to a handsome mannered baton. What about Surf's Up? What about that sheet music? This one says, a diamond necklace played the pawn, hand in hand, some drummed along to a handsome man and baton. If we actually go further in each of these sources, you will notice that they diverge in other ways even further as we go along. So right off the bat, we have a problem. The official sources that list what the lyrics are for this song do not agree with each other. And so the key objectives of this video are, one, can we reconstruct what the original lyrics to Surf's Up were given the resources that we have at our disposal? The second thing I want to discuss and figure out in this video is why there are so many variations of the lyrics. And the final thing is I wanted to discuss the meaning of the lyrics and what the song is about. So without further ado, let's begin. In terms of the original 1966 lyrics to Surf's Up, unfortunately, to my knowledge, Van Dyke Parks has never published the original lyric sheets to the song. Without that lyric sheet, it's really impossible to definitively say what exactly the lyrics were, but we can get close by using contemporaneous sources from that time that we do have access to. Key among them are the 1966 piano demo version of Surf's Up, which was the first version of Surf's Up ever recorded with vocals. That is actually where the Brian Wilson lead vocal for all the Beach Boys versions of the song that have his lead vocal on it at any point come from. They are taken from that specific performance. There is also the late 1967 piano solo version of Surf's Up. That version was more recently discovered and it was released for the first time on the Smile Sessions towards the end of disc one in all versions of the Smile Sessions. The lyrics that Brian sings in both versions are actually incredibly similar. In fact, they hardly deviate from one another at all, so there is a high amount of consistency between them. Meaning that in all likelihood, Brian Wilson knew the lyrics to the song quite well at that point in time. I only counted two instances where Brian deviates 
on the 1967 version from what he sang on the 1966 version. And I presume that that change was made for stylistic reasons, given the slower pace of the 1967 version compared to the original 1966 demo. The second resource that we can use is Van Dyke Parks himself. Van Dyke Parks, being the author of the lyrics, would know better than any other person on the planet what the lyrics actually are supposed to be and what the lyrics actually were back in the 60s. So whenever Van Dyke Parks has in the past quoted from Surf's Up and written down what the lyrics are in various contexts, we can use those lyrics to piece together what most likely were the lyrics in certain cases back when he wrote the song in 1966. However, it's worth noting that even creators sometimes are not infallible regarding certain aspects of their creations. One example that I like to bring up as an example of this is George Lucas and the origin of the name Darth Vader. In fan circles within the Star Wars community, it's commonly thought that George Lucas got the name Vader from the Dutch word for father, even though the Dutch word for father is pronounced Vader and not Vader. Other fans believe that it's a shortening of the word invader, as in Darth Vader invaded the Tanta V4 in A New Hope and the opening scene of the original Star Wars. And if you ask George Lucas, he will tell you that the former is true, that he got Vader from Vader, the Dutch word. But that is not true. He did not get the name Vader from Vader. He got the name from Gary Vader. Who is Gary Vader, you might ask? Gary Vader was a jock at George Lucas's high school who used to bully him. He took the name Vader from him. And likewise, Luke Skywalker, the name Luke comes from Lucas. But good luck trying to get George Lucas to admit that he basically took the name from the bully who used to pick on him in high school. So that's just one example among many. Nevertheless, most of George Lucas's claims about the origins of certain things within Star Wars are nonetheless true, but there is also a certain amount of historical revisionism that he engages in. So it's worth keeping in mind that even primary sources and creators are not perfect when it comes to the accuracy of what they may claim to be true actually being true. Nevertheless, when a creator's claim corroborates with contemporaneous evidence that we may otherwise have, that increases the likelihood of it being true and solidifies any claim of the creator. So Van Dyke Parks is absolutely a critical resource, but it's always good to back up any claims that he might make with contemporaneous evidence elsewhere if possible. The last resource isn't really even a resource in so much as it is a tool that we have to consider using in certain cases, and that is we have to determine and consider what the likely spelling of certain words may be. Van Dyke is a big fan of wordplay, and so spelling plays a key role in wordplay sometimes. And there are a couple of instances in Surf's Up where the spelling of certain words creates certain wordplay. Those spellings are not necessarily consistent between various versions. So in that case, we have to make assumptions and guesses, specifically educated guesses, about what the likely correct spelling of a particular word might be. But other than that, we have to be very careful about spelling because there's no way to prove how a word is supposed to be spelled absent of having those original lyric sheets at our disposal either way. So unless we were to have access to the original lyric sheets, we have to just make a guess as to what the likely spelling of certain words probably may have been. So with that said, I decided to re-listen to both the original 1966 piano demo of the song and the 1967 piano solo version of Surf's Up. The 1967 piano version of Surf's Up was an incredibly valuable tool to me in this process of re-listening to the song because of its sparser arrangement and slower pace. So in general, it is much easier to hear what Brian is singing on that version compared to the original 1966 piano demo. There is one exception to that, and that is the word mannered is easier to hear 
on the 1966 demo than it is on all other subsequent versions. But other than that, it is advisable that if you are going to be listening to the song yourself in an attempt to corroborate my claims about what the original lyrics were, I recommend that you start out listening to the 1967 version. It is much easier to hear the lyrics in that version. Once you identify the lyrics in that version to the greatest extent that you possibly can, then it is worth going back and re-listening to the 1966 demo. It makes it easier because you know how Brian sings and you know how he phrases words and pronounces words, and all of that is important to keep in mind when you're trying to verify and compare versions. Now, many people who have listened to Surf's Up over the years think that they know the lyrics, myself included. Before I did the process of re-listening to these songs for the purpose of reconstructing the lyrics, I had heard the 1967 piano solo version of the song probably a million times at least. And that's not an exaggeration because that is my favorite version of Surf's Up and Surf's Up is my favorite song. So quite literally, I listened to it a million times. And I always thought that I knew what it was that Brian was singing until one time where I went back and tried to corroborate and verify a claim that I saw on the internet a number of years ago, and I recently actually re-saw this claim by somebody over on the Smiley Smile message board. I believe it was the user who goes by the name of Salty Marshmallow over there, and I know he posts on the Endless Harmony forum as well. But he repeated a claim that I had heard several years ago, and that is that Brian is singing the diamond necklace play the pawn instead of played the pawn. When I first heard that claim years ago, I scoffed at it, thinking that it was nonsense. But after re-listening to the songs for the purpose of doing this video, I had a realization that Brian actually is singing Play the Pawn and not Played the Pawn. One of the things that we have a tendency to do as human beings when we listen to a song is we get caught up in the totality of the song and don't really focus on the specific utterances and pronunciations of words, especially if we think that we know the lyrics anyway ahead of time. So we have a tendency to want to sing along, if not aloud, then in our heads. And for many years, that is exactly what I did until I realized, holy crap, that's not Brian Wilson saying played with the ED at the end to make it past tense, that's me. I'm making that sound in my head as I am following along with the lyrics because, like most people, when they hear a song, they like to follow along either in their heads or out loud with the lyrics. They either sing along aloud or they follow along in their head aloud with the lyrics. And so that was my aha moment. Wait a minute. I don't actually know the lyrics as well as I believe I do. And I guarantee you that if you listen to that part of the song, the very first line in the 1967 piano solo version, you're going to have the same reaction as me because you're quickly going to realize, wait a minute, I'm doing the exact same thing. There is no ED there at the end. And it's very easy to tell, A, because of the pace of the song and it being much slower, but B, because he repeats the first line twice once to warm up, and then again, once he begins actually singing the song. So it's very clear there, there is no ED there, and that the word is actually play the pawn. Play is the word in question. And so I went back and I listened to both the 1966 piano demo and the 1967 piano solo version. And what I did was I created a document, which I'm going to show on screen in just a moment, and this document outlines my findings in terms of attempting to reconstruct the original lyrics to Serves Up as of 1966 and 67. Here it is on screen right now. I have created a color-coded guide within these visuals so that you can better identify visually what the differences in each version of the song actually are and what my sources are. In some cases, when it comes to spelling, I cannot make claims there, but I can make an educated guess. And so therefore I have highlighted those words in yellow just to symbolize the fact that you need to be cautious about 
the claims that I make about spellings of words. And now for comparison's sake, here are the lyrics to the 1971 version of Surf's Up. As I mentioned on this first page, when the song was being revived for the Surf's Up album circa 1971, Carl Wilson did not have access to Van Dyke Park's original lyric sheets. He did, however, have access, of course, to the 1966 piano demo. And so how the process worked was Carl would listen to that 1966 piano demo and he would transcribe what he believed Brian was singing, and those transcriptions turned into the lyrics. In some cases, he may have actually done this on purpose, but in other cases, it's possible that he may have just misheard what Brian was singing at certain points. It's really not known either way whether or not a certain change may have been purposeful or not. So I don't wanna make any claims about that, but nevertheless, that was the process, and that is the first point in history in terms of the original lyrics and future additions of the lyrics deviating from one another. It was really Carl Wilson and his changes that started this ball rolling, this cascading effect, if you will, of different versions of the lyrics popping up through the decades. When Brian Wilson revived Smile back in 2004, Van Dyke Parks was brought back to write lyrics for songs that originally did not have lyrics to them. But I suspect that he was also kept around to assist with the determining of lyrics for certain other songs that actually did have lyrics. In particular, some of the original lyrics from back in 1966 that he wrote reappear in the Brian Wilson Presents Smile CD booklets. And I suspect that that's not accidental, but was actually something that Van Dyke himself had a role in reintroducing. Nevertheless, he could not reintroduce all of the lyrics because some of the song simply had evolved to a certain point at that point in time where he couldn't. He had to match what Brian and Brian Wilson's backing band were singing at certain points. And so I suspect what happened was he kept certain words that Carl Wilson changed, but he changed back other words that Carl Wilson changed. And thus, officially, we would have a third version, even though the actual lyrics that Brian Wilson is singing on all Smile performances, whether we're talking about the Smile live shows or the Brian Wilson Presents Smile CD performance, the lyrics that he's singing in those performances are actually the 1971 lyrics. So that, again, created a cascade effect, which then made its way back into the Smile Sessions. And so when the Smile Sessions book was being put together and the choice was made to include the lyrics in the book, the Brian Wilson Presents Smile 
lyrics to the first part of the song, for the most part, were the ones that were used. Minus the first word, which was correctly changed to the, since that is what Brian sings on the original recording from the 1966 demo. However, they did not actually include the second half of the Brian Wilson Presents Smile lyrics. And so that created yet another variation where the first half of the song lyrically is very close to what you hear, but the second half of the song has Fired Rose instead of Fired Roast, which is what Ryan is actually singing on the completed version of Surf's Up from the Smile Sessions. And so basically what we have as a result of all this is we have three or four different versions, and so they're all kind of mixing and matching certain elements of the original two versions of the lyrics. The 1966 version of the lyrics and the 1971 version. So we have official sources mixing and matching, and that is why there is not a ton of consistency between official sources on what the actual lyrics to the song are. And so with this in mind, we can better track the evolution of the lyrics through time. Again, some of this is guesswork on my part, but it's educated guesswork. But hopefully now you better understand why the lyrics in various official sources have deviated from one another so much over the years. Now I want to talk about the meaning of the lyrics. In 1967, an article in Cheetah Magazine appeared, authored by Jules Siegel, in which Jules interviewed Brian Wilson, and Brian Wilson talked about the subject matter of Surf's Up. I'm going to read the famous quote that Brian Wilson gave to Jules Siegel regarding the subject matter of Surf's Up. It's a man at a concert, he said. All around him, there's the audience playing their roles, dressed up in fancy clothes, looking through opera glasses, but so far away from the drama, from life. Back through the opera glass, you see, the pit and the pendulum drawn. The music begins to take over. Columnated runes domino. Empires, ideas, lives, institutions, everything has to fall, tumbling like dominoes. He begins to awaken to the music, sees the pretentiousness of everything. The music hall, a costly bow. Then, even the music is gone, turned into a trumpeter swan, into what the music really is. Canvas the town and brush the backdrop. He's off in his vision on a trip. Reality is gone. He's creating it like a dream. Dove-nested towers. Europe, a long time ago, the laughs come hard in all lang syne. The poor people in the cellar taverns trying to make themselves happy by singing. Then there's the parties, the drinking, trying to forget the wars, the battles at sea. While at port, I do or die. Ships in the harbor battling it out, a kind of Roman Empire thing. A choke of grief, at his own sorrow, at the emptiness of life, because he can't even cry for the suffering in the world for his own suffering. And then hope. Surf's up. Come about hard and join the once and often spring you gave. Go back to the kids, to the beach, to childhood. I heard the word of God. Wonderful thing. The joy of enlightenment, of seeing God. And what is it? A children's song. And then there's the song itself, the song of children. The song of the universe rising and falling in wave after wave. The song of God, hiding his love from us, but always letting us find him again, like a mother singing to her children. The record was over. Wilson went into the kitchen and squirted Ready Whip direct from the can into his mouth, made himself a chocolate great shake, and ate a couple of candy bars. Side note, I find that very amusing, that juxtaposition of that quote in this explanation. Of course, that's a very intellectual explanation, he said. But maybe sometimes you have to do an intellectual thing. If they don't get the words, they'll get the music, because that's where it's really at, in the music. You can get hung up in words, you know. Maybe they work, I don't know. And so from that quote, we get the subject matter of the song and what it's really describing and about. It's about a man at a concert who realizes the pretentiousness of everything that is going on around him and how far removed it is from the real world and the common people's struggles to survive. He eventually undergoes a religious awakening where he realizes that the key to societal happiness and to make society better is to return to the joy and enlightenment and ways of childhood. And so that is where the common understanding of what the song is about stems from. It's from this quote from Brian Wilson. 
When we analyze that quote in more detail, it really reveals some of the hidden meanings that exist within the lyrics themselves. And in the next section, I want to get into what some of those hidden meanings and references actually are, because I feel it's fascinating, and I feel that it helps people understand the song better once they are made aware of these references and messages in it. The Diamond Necklace Play the Pawn So actually, there are two things about this line that I've heard. I'm only really going to go into depth about one of them, but they both pretty much use the same kind of logic, and that is the opening line to Surf's Up may have been purposefully crafted to be misheard or sound similar to the diamond necklace play upon. Now, necklace in this case is neck, as in the body part, neck, less, as in L-E-S-S and not neckless as in neck lace, which is really how it's spelled. To stick your neck out for someone or something means to stand up for them. But if you're not going to do that, then one could say that you are neckless in that case. It could also be a reference to the phrase having no neck in the game. In other words, it's easy for these high-class aristocrats to ignore or be ignorant of the well-being of others in their society. And so one can interpret this lyric as almost the starting point for the narrator to the song in terms of realizing what is wrong with this picture here. While he is indoors and amongst all these high-class aristocrats in fancy clothes enjoying this concert performance, out there in the real world within their society, their society has decayed to a point where people are suffering in mass. And so that could be the starting point for his self-journey and self-realizations. This kind of wordplay, where one sentence is crafted in a way to be misheard or sound like another sentence, is known as mondegreen. I have also heard a claim that goes a step further. Rather than saying the diamond necklace play upon, one claim that I've heard tries to argue that the opening two words are meant to sound more like the die mound. In other words, die, D-I-E, hyphen, mound. In other words, a mound on which death occurs, or a mound of dead bodies. Really, die mound is not a word in English. If you say that to anybody, they're going to be like, what? But nevertheless, if you hyphenate those two words and turn it into a compound noun, it nevertheless conjures up imagery of dead bodies piled on top of one another. So that takes this whole thing a step further. However, I'm really not sure if I believe that latter claim. To me, it's a bit of a stretch to say that diamond is meant to sound like dime mound, which isn't even a word. But I felt it was interesting enough to at least mention verbally. Hand in hand, some drummed along to a handsome-mannered baton, a blind class aristocracy. Okay, so here, Van Dyke actually means to say a class-blind aristocracy. One of the things that Van Dyke occasionally did during this period of time that he was composing the lyrics to Smile songs is that he would purposefully switch words around. So probably the most famous example of him doing this is in the infamous line, over and over the crow cries and cover the cornfield, over and over the thresher and hover the wheat field. That famous line, actually is a case of Van Dyke doing the same kind of thing. Here he's doing it on a much smaller scale, but in Cabin Essence, he's actually doing it with two separate sentences. The line actually is, over and over the crow cries and hovers the cornfield. Over and over the thresher uncovers the wheat field. What Van Dyke did is he swapped the verbs around of those two sentences. What he did was he took the verbs uncover and hover, and he basically swapped them between sentences and chopped off the S's at the end for grammatical purposes. And so you get over and over the crow cries uncover the cornfield, over and over the thresher and hover the wheat field, just from doing that. Here, he's doing the same thing, but it's literally just swapping two words with each other in the same line. A class blind aristocracy becomes a blind class aristocracy, which flows better lyrically. Back through the opera glass, you see the pit and the pendulum drawn. The pit in this context is really referring to the orchestra pit, most likely, but 
There's also here a reference to the Edgar Allan Poe short story, The Pit and the Pendulum. It's worth noting that both Brian and Van Dyke were and are fans of Edgar Allan Poe. We also see this reference to Edgar Allan Poe in the next line, the famous columnated runes domino. So in addition to what Brian explained in that famous interview that I just read from in the previous section of this video, this is also probably a reference to the Edgar Allan Poe short story, The Fall of the House of Usher, where literally a mansion actually comes crumbling to the ground and the columns in that mansion basically fall like dominoes. Hung velvet overtaken me, dim chandelier awakened me, again, more describing of what's going on at the concert, to a song dissolve in the dawn. So this is the point, as Brian points out, within the song where the narrator loses his grip on reality and really is off in his vision. The music hall, a costly bow. So this is more use of Mondegreen here, specifically again, deliberate Mondegreen. This time with hall, a costly, meant to sound like holocaustly. The music all is lost for now to a muted trumpeter swan. So the line a muted trumpeter swan can be interpreted several different ways, but as I note in the visual that you're seeing on screen, I believe it's most likely a reference to the song that is commonly known as Bugle Call, Awake for Morning Call, which is the song that is traditionally played on trumpets to awaken military personnel in the morning. So it's the do 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 that song specifically. And swan can be interpreted as a reference to a swan song, which is basically the last performance that is given just before death or retirement or some kind of ending to something. Again, this kind of reinforces the idea that there is suffering that is going on in the society that the protagonist of the song belongs to. And it's kind of a wake up call to him that this scene that he is at really is not representative of what's going on in his society at that point. Columnated runes domino, canvas the town and brush the backdrop. So to canvas something with one S is really just to cover something with a canvas, i.e. a piece of cloth in which one can paint on canvas the town and brush the backdrop evokes that image of somebody painting a scene. However, canvas with two S's, which is by far the more common form of the verb, is to really just solicit opinions or thoroughly investigate or discuss or debate something. And this again implies that the high society types at this concert are kind of either indifferent to or ignorant of the common folk and what is going on outside of their self-contained world and in their society at large. And it's almost used as a plea, a plea to the fellow concert goers to not be blind to this and to actually be responsible and do something about it. Are you sleeping, Brother John? So musically and lyrically at this point in the song, there is a reference to the nursery rhyme Frere Jaca which is about a French friar who was notorious for oversleeping. Frere Jacques is also known in English as Brother John. Again, it's a plea to wake up to these realities and do something about them. Dove-nested towers, the hour was strike the street, quick silver moon. So here it's more about establishing the setting of the song. It's revealed to take place in a urban environment in some kind of organized society, Europe a long time ago, according to what Brian Wilson stated to Jules Siegel. Carriage across the fog to step to lamplight cellar tune. The laps come hard in all lang syne. The poor people struggling to survive, drinking in taverns, making themselves happy by singing, as Brian Wilson revealed in his quote to Jewel Siegel. All lang syne, for anybody who does not know, is a song that is traditionally sung at gatherings to mark farewells or endings to occasions or to mark the end of a previous year and the beginning of a new year. The glass was raised, the fire roast, the fullness of the wine, the dim last toasting. Here again, Van Dyke is using imagery to describe a scene, perhaps a scene that's going on at one of these taverns. While at port, a do or die. A do or die is likely a play on the phrase do or die. In other words, they have to go through with something that they're about to do. Perhaps they are drinking and partying and celebrating in order to numb themselves to the reality of what they are about to face 
or to what they have faced in the past, or even what they are currently facing. A choke of grief, heart hard and I, beyond belief, a broken man, too tough to cry. So here is where spelling really comes into play when it comes to crafting a specific instance of wordplay. Heart hardened eye, if you use the spelling of eye that is used for eyeballs, E-Y-E, -E, then this becomes a play on words because one really cannot distinguish between E-Y-E, -E, as in eyeball, that kind of eye, versus I, the pronoun I. And so in reality, when you're listening to this song and you hear this line, this then becomes both. In other words, crying is something that happens traditionally through the eyes. Your eyes almost leak tears. They expel tears. When your eyes are hardened, that means that they cannot expel tears. When we speak about the heart, we speak about the heart as being the source of emotion. So somebody's heart who has been hardened, in other words, has also had their eyes hardened because they can't cry because they don't have the emotion necessary to do so. So this becomes a play on words where it's both I, the eyeball, and I, the pronoun, in this case, referring to the narrator of the song. Surfs up aboard a tidal wave. This reference and imagery could be used here to indicate that there is a coming wave of social change that absolutely needs to happen in order to save the narrator's society at large. But outside of the song's self-contained narrative, there's a lot that went on at this point in the 1960s that you could argue that this surfs up aboard a tidal wave statement and imagery is meant to allude to. You could also view it as the end or the coming of how the Beach Boys themselves are going to be viewed in the future versus how they were viewed in the past. In other words, this song and the album Smile in general would have marked a point in the band's history from what they were at the beginning of the 60s in the first half of the 60s to what they would have become in the latter half of the 60s. Come about hard and join the young and often spring you gave. I heard the word, and this is where he has a spiritual enlightenment. We know from Brian that this is the word of God, and that word is a children's song. The joy, wisdom, and enlightenment of children. So there's a number of ways you can think about this. Children are blank slates for the most part, meaning that there is a purity to how they think and how they operate. The narrator could be saying that society at large needs to recapture that innocence and purity in order to get back to loving one another as people within their society. Outside of the song's internal narrative, however, you could also view this again as a reference to and a commentary on the generational divide that existed between the younger and older generations, which was going on at that time within American society. In other words, it could be saying, listen to the younger generation, there is wisdom here, and we need to be heard. And then the song ends with the lyrics, a children's song, have you listened as they play? Their song is love and the children know the way. So these were 1971 additions to the song. In the early to mid 90s, I believe, Jack Riley, who was the band's manager at the time in 1971, claimed that these words were authored by all six Beach Boys and himself, meaning that his claim was, it took seven people to write these lyrics. In contrast, David Beard, who is the editor and chief of Endless Summer Quarterly, which is a Beach Boys fanzine that is very well known within the Beach Boys fan community, claims that his sources have told him that Brian Wilson himself wrote these words. And I find that to be a lot more believable than Jack Riley's claim. And I think to emphasize this point, it's best to compare these lyrics to the lyrics you find in Till I Die, which is another song that Brian wrote around this time period that features lyrics by him and only him. In Till I Die, there is a simplicity and directness to those lyrics that you similarly find here in these lyrics here in Surf's Up. But aside from the simplicity and directness, both sets of lyrics in question here, the entirety of Till I Die and these specific lyrics to the end tag of Surf's Up are incredibly poignant. And that quality above all else is what I think really hits home in this comparison. I know that that's not a very scientific way of looking at it, but I think that if you analyze those lyrics until I die and compare them to these lyrics here in Surf's Up, you will see that there is a connection there versus 
the opposing view being seven people wrote this, I don't really find convincing. And that's it. That is what I wanted to discuss regarding Surf's Up's lyrics. Thank you so much for watching and smile on. Peace.